moment. Um, so I'd like to welcome you all and also like to welcome and thank the sponsor for this particular broadcast from Dada Enterprises, Sashin, who sat um, right in the middle of the, <laughs> the screen at the moment. Um, so, well, th thanks for the support, Sashin, and wel welcome, to, welcome to the session. Um, uh, I think uh, it's going to be an interesting one. Anything you'd like to, to say to the assembled multitude? Um, no, it's just uh, appreciate that EVA 25 is uh, changing its format, so it's happy to be part of that journey. Um, we, we are also looking forward to how Paul Lilas is going to summarize Sophie's uh, session from last week uh, and uh, <laughs> combining oh, yeah. post tree and project controls, which is, I think is the world's first. And, um, and it's going to be really interesting, this session, because of Network Rail's uh, mm. work in terms of East Coast mainline, the, you know, the, the work which they've been doing in terms of spearheading the next generation of project controls over there. So looking forward to the session and learning from it. Thank you very much. Thanks, Ashin. Uh, well, that was a, a huge challenge, uh, Alistair. So, uh, so if I could now invite you all to um, switch your videos off, please. I'm also going to mute everybody except myself and Alistair for the time being. Which means, Alistair, that you may well have to... Um, oh, do you want to stay like this? Can you switch yourself back on? Your microphone, Alistair. Yeah, I have done. Oh, you've done it, right? So it's just me and you now. I'll go. I'll go away in a minute too, because it'll be embarrassing if I, you know, I'll be, I'll be, pulling, <laughs> I'll be pulling faces or something. Like that. Just to, oh, to, to say, really, yeah, really. Well, I just want to make sure that. Uh, do you want to? Are you? Do you want to take control of the screen and um, uh, get your presentation ready? Uh, um, I was just going to say it's a great pleasure to have Alistair uh, uh, along here and we were comparing notes this morning and it must be around 13 years since I, I first met him at their training establishment in or their sort of university college at uh, uh, near Warwick when Alistair was uh, I think relatively new to re Network Rail and I was trying to convince them that earned value was the best thing since sliced bread and I seem to remember that Alistair was relatively sceptical well, I, I can tell you that after 13 years, um, he remains relatively sceptical, I think. Um, notwithstanding that, he's deeply committed to project controls and, um, uh, uh, again, very, very happy and glad that he's coming along to talk to us about how uh, they're working at Network Rail. And also to, to say thanks, he's, he's joined us recently on the, uh, the BSI uh, MS2 panel to, to, to create the, the project control standard for the UK as well. So he's a, an active member on, on that panel group as well. Um, so again, somebody who's giving back to the profession as well as contributing to it uh, professionally. So welcome, Alistair. The, uh, the floor is yours for the next 25 minutes. Um, please kick off. Are you up there and working? Uh, I'm going to check. Can people see the screen? I can minimise it if you can't. There we are. Is that you? Because me, me and technology never ever usually get on very well. <laughs> well, I'll switch, hopefully, this off and see whether we've got you. Is the PowerPoint up on the screen, I suppose, is the key question. Um, no, no, not at the moment. I it, yeah. Have you, you've, you've, you've grabbed the share button, have you? Yeah, I think so. And you've lo you're loading it? Well, it's up on my screen, which is the first challenge. It popped up briefly and then the gallery, this gallery came back up. Yeah, should I get try and get rid of this? Uh, hang on, hang on. Let's try that. Looks like I've lost the share some for some reason. There you are. It looks like you're in. Good Brilliant. Evening. Excellent. All right. The wonders right, of technology. <laughs> right. Afternoon, all. Um, thanks for joining us on the this uh, next endeavour on the EVA journey. Um, just conscious that uh, Sophie did set the bar very high last week, so uh, hopefully I can uh, maintain that level, or we may, uh, may we may drop the bar slightly. Who knows? Um, 
one thing you will note is that I was uh, posted as the head of program controls. Um, I've subsequently changed roles since uh, Steve did the original invite for myself. So uh, I'm now sort of looking at this heady thing called affordability. But uh, we'll talk around the controls and what we did. Um, previously, it's now been uh, headed up by Andrew Smith, who used to be in the uh, signaling arena. So talking about um, controls and really just sort of um, talking a little bit about the journey we've been on within Network Rail um, as we've sort of gone through trying to define what is controls, what do we want, what do we not want, etc. So sort of the first thing to do is just sort of set a bit of context um, for those who don't know uh, who on what Network Rail is. Um, there's a sort of brief overview there. As it sort of says there, we own and operate the infrastructure um, for England, Scotland and Wales, and it's on behalf of us all in terms of a national uh, commodity. Um, in terms of the business, it's going through uh, a, a transformation at the moment. We're at the final stages of the Putting Passengers First um, initiative um, and the sort of, sort of transformation of the business into a more regional organisation. Um, looking to give them greater autonomy um, in terms of what they do and how they do it, um, and therefore get better linkages to the train operators and the freight operators, and therefore um, look at those services and make sure that the services and what we provide is more aligned to their needs and ultimately our needs as the passenger. As you can see there, five regions. Um, uh, all sort of set out and within those regions there are overall 13 sub uh, sub subgroups or routes as they're referred to which are essentially the major lines of route um, and the, the key operating uh, the key alignment with the operators um, the key thing probably I would like to sort of pull out is really um, we're funded in what's referred to control periods which are five-year blocks um, our last blocks just started, which is control period six in 2019, and we'll run through to uh, 2024. And within that, um, not only do we get the sort of operational money and the, the maintenance monies um, to support the infrastructure, we also get funded for our renewals. So that's the like for like replacement um, refurbishments of the infrastructure and we've got about 19 billion pounds to to uh, to to spend within the uh, within the five year period enhancements is slightly different we are subject to green book it was part of the changes that happened in the last control period um, through the bow review but essentially there is a um, and i'll put this in very big inverted commas a sort of ring fence fund of about uh, 10 billion um, aligned um, with Treasury India and our colleagues in the department um, for undertaking enhancements. That's obviously, and I've got to caveat that heavily now, that's all subject to the spending review, which we're currently undergoing. And we know that there's going to be challenges to that um, with regards to COVID um, and, and, and everything else that's going on at the moment. Overall, that sort of equates to about a £5 billion spend per annum. And in, within that uh, expenditure, we do undertake about six to 8,000 projects um, per year. So that just hopefully gives you a little bit of a flavor um, for what goes on. Controls. Uh, I got asked a question uh, a few years ago when I got uh, asked to sort of uh, undertake a, and sort of reintroduce and realign program controls within network rail that was about 2015. Um, Alistair, I understand what planning is, I understand what commercial is, I understand what a QS does, but I have not got a clue what this thing called controls is. Um, my immediate response to that was, well, it's basically sticky oil. Um, and I sort of got this blank look back at me going, what planet are you on, Alistair? And I won't say it was my idea. It was a, a terminology I heard a number of years ago. But I thought it was really good um, reference to actually what is controls. And the fundamental principle, and I sort of went on to explain, is it's 
the the mechanism by which we bring all the different functional subgroups, specialisms, however you want to describe it, within the business that um, are supporting the delivery of our projects and our programs together and make sure that the information and um, everything is aligned. So essentially, it's it's a almost a fancy term for what some people would refer to as configuration management. And it's just making sure that everything we do is aligned so that if we have a plan and we have a cost plan, the two are aligned. They are actually against the same data set, against the same baseline, change controls undertaken, undertaken um, anything to do with resource management is done. Um, we're undertaking strategic planning and are the, is the work and the project aligned to the strategic plan? So it's, it's going through all those types of activity and making sure that that's all aligned. And that to me is the, the fundamental principle of controls. And then obviously within that we have, as is normally uh, aligned, is the sort of subservices of planning, risk and value, cost planning, et cetera, which normally get put into that functional group. But it's that fundamental principle. It's about making sure about information alignment. Then you start to look and say, well, actually, um, what is the requirement of controls? And I always think of it, and this is a personal view, it's a bit Jekyll and Hyde. Um, on one hand, the sort of Mr. Hyde's side is that we're providing a service um, and we provide those support services to the project teams. We provide that expertise, that capability and um, the information flow that the project manager and project directors, etc., all require to be able to deliver the output or outcome that's being requested of them. On the flip side, and I think it's more obvious in controls than probably some of the other um, sort of functional professions, is it's around the governance. Um, and that's probably the evil component as far as the projects and the community are concerned. It's about the process definition, um, making sure that we've got mandates and controls around certain uh, pieces of information, whether that be milestones, whether that be how cost is recorded. Um, as we go through those sort of things, how documents are managed, what information should be stored, where. It's then going through, are we compliant? So it's checking, are the almost the service providers can be in compliant with the um, overarching process and procedures. It's providing assurance to the business that actually the project is and the group of projects inside the portfolio, the investment portfolio is being executed in a consistent and coherent way. Um, obviously supports the review and challenge process, um, whether you want to call it a spiky chair moment or anything else like that. And also sort of provides a level of independent review and validation. But I think one of the major um, and most important areas that's, that's in there is actually people and our capability. And it's been able to demonstrate um, both internally and externally that actually we have good, competent, capable people undertaking the work. And I think that's becoming more and more a key element as we move forwards is about that demonstration of uh, capability. One of the biggest areas of contention that we've had in Network Rail is the, the balance of, is it a uh, centralization, decentralization? Is it HQ driven initiative or should actually um, we give more freedom and more direction to um, the sort of sub business of the regions? And in Network Rail, we've been quite a journey on that. Um, when I first joined the business some 15 years ago, it was very much around centralization. The central controls function would dictate directly to all the practitioners how they would do things, and um, that was the gospel. Um, we then moved through a period of transition, and there was a, a key point in, I think, 2012, um, where the, the sort of major projects as a group as it was then was devolved into a, a slightly different regional state. 
And actually, Controls was almost, um, because we'd had such good applaudits from uh, external reviews and everything else, independent reporter um, reviews, that Controls was really strong, the view was actually we could take that more into a virtual um, control state. Um, and the sort of HQ function, central function, was significantly reduced with the idea that each of the regional bodies would be more self-fulfilling. Um, went on, the, the realisation occurred that that wasn't quite the right model. The pendulum had swung way too far the other way. And that's where I got involved then, got involved in around 2015 and asked to sort of think about how could we reintroduce and, and bring in a more a, a form of centralization that sort of fitted the business. It wasn't about going back to what we had previously, but what could we do? And that's where we you start to get into the, the dynamic of um, is it frameworks or is it defined processes? How do we do assurance? So we have a, a, a three level assurance process um, and it's about trying to decide, well, the level one, as we refer to it, which is the sort of um, the, the bottom tier, the first point of uh, defence is very much within the project in the region. The level two so sort of sits between a level three is really audit. And it was uh, the discussions in the, the grey area where we've always tried to find the balance was in that sort of level two. Was it regional? Was it um, central? And we I think we eventually found that balance point. Um, capability assessment and development. Um, again, it's about um, each of the regional organisations can think about their own capability. They know their people. They know who's involved. The people don't move around the business um, significantly. The, if they're in a region, they generally stay in that region. But it's about how do we develop those people give them further experience and diversity in that role. But overall, um, we need a consistent capability um, assessment process and criteria, and that's sort of sat with the HQ. I think one of the key areas about, and one of the advantages of actually working in a more devolved um, controls arena is really in innovation. If, if you lock people down into singular processes and constrain them, you don't actually give people freedom to move. And one of the comments that was made about um, some of the um, elements that are going on on the East Coast main line, for example, if we'd had a very fixed and rigid um, approach, that innovation that those individuals are developing, the refinement they're making, how they're tempering the processes to support actually the activities they're doing, just wouldn't have been readily possible. So I think that's one of the benefits of where we've now sort of found that sort of balance point um, as we go through. I touched on it before, and it was one of the key things that I was really passionate about and I'm passionate about is really about professional uh, capability. Um, one of the key things that I've always noticed within, especially within the controls arena, um, and it became more apparent when we when we sort of saw the the introduction of the um, chartership for the uh, the project managers is that there isn't really a chartership or a fellowship process for anybody who works in the controls functions. So there isn't really anything for the planners in terms of becoming a, a chartered planner or scheduler, depends on what terminology you want to use, similarly with the control space or even in the document management space. So one of the key things I was really passionate about was about finding uh, institutions which could support us in that endeavour. And eventually it, was, it took about two years to get there to find an appropriate institution. But we, we ended up aligning with the Association of Controls Management. Because also we have two forms of planning um, within our business. We have the sort of project program type planning in terms of what are we going to do, how are we going to deliver it. We also have um, a key number of planners who deal with the day-to-day -day activity of actually getting access to the rail network, managing um, that access, um, setting it up, controlling it. That's a lot nearer term, which doesn't quite Whilst the, the attributes are the same, the actual 
uh, methodologies are slightly different and the requirements are slightly different. And that's where we then also align with the Institute of Rail Operators because that actually offers them the appropriate um, credibility and reference guides, materials, etc., cetera, um, for that element of the planning profession. Um, what we also then did was, we'd had it for a number of years in the business, but it sort of fallen into a bit of disarray, was actually going back through and re-establishing the competency profiles. So you think about the competency wheel that I've got on the, the one side there around technical skills, people skills, leadership skills. We really started to focus in on some of those sort of technical skills. What would we expect? What what sh what credibility should we have? How do we define how competent our people are? How do we define actually what development would be right for that individual? So we went through a process of in each of what I would call our specialisms. So in, in our case, in the network in the controls function with the network rail, that was really around. Um, planning controls itself and um, document management creating three uh, revised competency profiles associated with that was then actually the development or training guide and what we created around that was an interactive training guide that says if i'm a level two now how do i get to become a level three what things do i need to do um, and that's not always about going put a in the old speak a bum on the seat or in a training center that could be going and undertaking a different project or getting involved in something else or get somebody else involved in a functional activity that would increase their skills, their knowledge and their experience. What we also did was aligned with an external um, accredited training provider. Um, and we really wanted one that was ECITB approved. And there aren't very many of them out there, so you can probably guess who the training provider is. Um, and we had, they had on their provision two principal courses, which was, you can see there, the introductory controls and the certificate and project controls. Uh, one is about a three day course. One is a nine month uh, undertaking that um, has a number of modules in it. And there's also some essentially homework to do in real world um, to do in the interim piece. What they also did was work with us to actually create a additional course which has now been certified um, which is in planning and scheduling so there's actually now um, in their arsenal a planning and scheduling course to to bolster that and there's also they've also got a very good um, document management uh, provision in the, in that place as well one of the key aspects that i got challenged with um, when i sort of took back over which was actually how are you going to add value Alistair how, how what's the value proposition and I think we've all been in places where um, I know for in our instance we've got absolutely stacks of data but actually translating that data into information getting to a point of actually how can we gain insight from that it's actually the insight that uh, my directors and other um, members want. They don't necessarily need the information. The information backs up, but it's about giving them that insight. What does that mean? You've told me this, you've told me we've got this problem, or that it looks like this is going a, a, a bit south. Um, what can we do about it? Why is it happening? What's going on? When you look at these normal pathways, they then say they get to, it, their insight then leads to experience, but i not quite sure that that's the case i think there's experience which actually helps form that insight and we're still on that journey and you can sort of see by the the indication on the arrows where i thought so i think we are on that journey into we've moved from a data position we've got to an information position we we've gained knowledge but are we actually in a position yet both in people capability and our technology to really drive that insight um, we've got a lot going on in the space around what I would call um, learning lessons rather than knowledge management. We're trying to translate that around in a slightly different way to say, can we learn from our previous experiences? And that to me all blends back together to give that insight. And that is what, where I see our key focus and our key challenge being currently uh, is about really aspiring to get really effective insight. 
So where next? Um, we're, we're on an evolutionary path into this uh, magical world of machine learning. Um, and to me, that's really helpful in that area. I've just talked about that insight. Um, that process and the use of either whether you use advanced analytics, which I think is the, as, as I get informed, the sort of lower end of the machine learning um, application of machine learning, right the way through to some of the more advanced, what's referred to as unsupervised machine learning. Um, it really gets starts to drive out from all that oodle of data, all that oodle of information, all that past knowledge, can you actually drive and predict what could happen? So in, in our case at the moment, we've got, um, we've applied what I would call the advanced analytics solution into our cost stacks. And we've already demonstrated that actually the machine can actually predict where um, an AFC will go on a project a lot earlier than we do. We take out the optimism bias. We take out yeah, it'll be all right. We and we've noticed that um, both uh, ourselves as humans and the machine end up at the same point. But what you notice, the machine got there a lot faster and got there um, in terms of that prediction a lot earlier in the uh, sort of monetary cycle. And we've also just uh, taken an adventure with a, with a, as a proof of concept with another um, organisation into um, doing schedule analysis and that's a pure um, what I would call unsupervised machine learning and that I, I'll be honest uh, with, uh, like Steve said I'm a skeptic I'm a skeptic um, I was quite skeptical about it and they've already demonstrated that actually it works um, the methodology works the approach works we're now taking the next step on that sort of proof of concept to say, actually, can it work in, in the total real world? Um, and can we get a, a genuine return on investment and uh, a bank for our book? So probably enough of me speaking. Um, really over to you guys to ask uh, whatever you want. Any hands up? Stunned him into silence. <laughs> um, what a surprise. Martin Paver has it. I wonder what you're going to ask us about, Martin. Hey. Hello, Steve. <laughs> Hello. Great well, presentation. Thanks, Alistair. So I do a lot of work in uh, project data analytics, and we've set up a task force and things like that. What's your plan for the next two years? Where do you see this going? Well, at the moment, we're... Um, I'm just Trying to sort my windows out here. Sorry, apologies. It's better. I can see you now. Um, we're we're on a, a, a best way I can describe it is a journey. Um, at the moment, Andy's um, writing up the strategy for what is our sort of machine learning approach. Because pre up to now, it's been a bit of a let's see whether we can get any value out of it. We've got a massive um, data lake as it's referred to, we've now got sort of Power BI um, applications now running. Um, we're designing um, the information construct such that people can add additional information and pull um, sort of centralized information so the regions can do a lot more of their own dynamic reporting um, with some of their own information added. Um, along with the sort of centrally collected information. But in terms of the machine learning journey, I think um, we are still our class as floundering infants that are sort of um, looking at it saying, yes, it sort of works, but how do we actually now apply this in earnest? Where can we apply it? So at the moment, I say we've got the two limited areas where we've looked at it in terms of our sort of main principle forecasting for our cost uh, base to obviously support our client and uh, expenditure profile and try and remove any surprises there. We've just done the foray into scheduling about actually can we analyze schedules to get um, confidence that the quality of the schedule is good and is robust and the likelihood of it be actually delivering um, what it said it's going to. 
But there's other opportunities, especially into our cost estimating space. We're, we're obviously involved with the um, the ties uh, piece, the transport infrastructure efficiency task force, and the living lab within that, and the analytical consortium that's supporting DFT and uh, Innovate UK in that. And they're now starting to look at some of our cost information, some of our estimating processes to try and see if there's opportunity where we can start to use some of the machine learning capabilities that they have into helping us better predict, get our estimates into a better position and issues like that. So I think, we're, we, as I said, we're very much at the start of our journey. Um, I think we're ahead of others. And there are others who are ahead of us, and it's it's trying to understand um, where the opportunities lie. Cool. Hopefully that answers you, Martin. I don't know. Yeah, cool. Thank you. And in terms of impacts on the project controls roles, you now what does that look like in in two or three years' time? Is it be a massively different role, or do you just see you know you've got a new bag of tools? I see it very much as it's. The machine learning component is very much an additional tool set. You cannot take away, this is a personal view, um, but you cannot take away from the human individual um, making a decision, understanding what's going on and there. What all I see that is, is an additional piece of information that says, based on previous experience and using the knowledge base from all that data, which we could never process, in our heads, um, the prediction would be that. And it, to me, that's just an additional uh, tool in that toolbox to say, yeah, that's an additional inf piece of information I now have. What does that mean in the context of everything else that I've got that um, that's telling me? And therefore, that's what I say. To me, it's all about driving that insight. It's about taking it, dot, dot, just producing a report and saying, there's the report. Um, it's about saying, what does that actually mean? Helping. Um, both the project teams and, and members of the project team, the project directors and the business leadership in that sort of understanding of what that what that's the information is telling them and what recommendations or options they may have for consideration. OK, so th thanks, Martin. Um, I, I, I think that that Alistair is leading us into uh, again, we've said we've uttered the words that project controls people We'll probably move into becoming analyst advisors and that might more better describe what uh, what some of the expectations are and, and what again some of the opportunities are for for the profession um, yeah i, th I, th I think it's probably two sides to that steve because i think we, yeah. we, we can't lose the basis of what i believe controls is is, is part of that configuration management yeah. aspect and we've got to be careful we don't lose that sure. because otherwise it will just we'll end up with uh, catastrophe because data won't align, information won't align. So yeah. I think it's going to be a duality of that element. Yeah, I'm I'm sure your prudence and caution will 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 make sure it doesn't. <laughs> no, you're quite right, uh, Carol. You had your hand up. Thank you. Um, I'll take it down now. What's I remember? Um, I wonder, can we go as you've got your presentation on on the screen? Can we go to slide six? Because uh, my question is is around the skills and competencies. Um, yeah, I'll have to reload it. Sorry. <laughs> oh no, sorry. That's that's fine. It was still on my screen. Oh, okay. Yeah. Go no, on. I'll try no and something that. Put it back up. But... Exactly. No, no worries at all. Uh, so you you mentioned um, uh, different levels, level two, level three. You talked about the ECTIB approved courses and and that they've just. Um, designed a, a, another course for you, another two courses. Um, my interest area is all around skills and how they're defined um, and um, and the words we use to to define them and also around, you know, is it a competency, is it a behaviour, is it an attribute, etc. Yeah. So I was wondering, a um, couple of questions, what, what do you mean by level two and level three? And what would you say is the general split in these new courses between technical skills and the, the softer, more transferable people-based skills? Okay, the, the approach we've used in the business is we have um, the, these, I'll answer the second, the second question first. The, um, 
in terms of the skill base, in terms of the training, that's more technical. But obviously, it will touch on some of the softer elements uh, as you're going through. Um, and the, the basis around that is inside the business, we have a plethora of um, leadership, management training courses and everything else and behavioral training uh, attributes. So the view was that we didn't need to um, take that on. That was already covered by our existing sort of HR and uh, overall support groups in terms of that approach. So we could focus purely on that technical element. Um, as I said, the, the courses will undoubtedly, just by the very nature of them being an interactive course, and especially on the, uh, the two courses which are protracted over nine months, you will gain some knowledge of collaboration and working with people and things like that. So it will bring out some of the behaviorals just mm. by the door. Um, default rather than design. Um, in terms of the, <clears throat> the competency framework, uh, we have we uh, the, 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 you go around a number of organisations, and some have three levels, some have seven levels, some have four levels. Mm. Um, you can go wherever you want. We um, have defaulted at five levels, and that's been in the business for a long time. And the idea at the extreme end, at what we call commerce level five, is that basically you are the knowledge leader in the business. You are the guru who everybody would go to to ask for something. So in other words, you're the expert. Um, level one is the sort of new starter, new entrant, whether that be a graduate coming in with, yes, they have got some knowledge and some skills, but they haven't necessarily got the experience or the, the specialism type activities. And you sort of work through. So that sort of gives you the range, I hope, that Carol was about. Mm -hmm. um, what sits in between and what we've done is in each level we've outlined what we expect and again this is because these are technical elements we do have behavioral competencies and we do have management stroke leadership competencies that run alongside this so the ones I had up on the screen are, are the pure technical element um, about what we would expect that individual to be able to demonstrate or do at that level and then um, the key key component that the bit of work that was actually the hard work that sat behind that was then how do we help somebody go from a level to a next level? And obviously, uh, from an organisational perspective, we we also gone through and put down what the expected level of um, a individual in a certain job role. So for each job role, there's a sort of profile of competency where we'd expect them to be in scoring. Um, so if you were, I don't know, I'm going to pick one out, a, a project planner, and you had a, you were expected to be at competency level three, but you were actually currently at level two. It was then about giving them the information to say, how do I get to a, become a level three? What do I need to do personally? And then that could then go into their professional development plan and get signed off by the, both their line manager and the functional manager. And then um, they would agree how they would help that individual make that progression. And it could just be as simple as a training course or a bit of experience, or it could be more significant. Actually, they need to go and be involved in a different project, which would then stretch them individually, but also mm. round off some of those skills or give them um, an appreciation in a, a different area. Mm. Brilliant. Thank you. Can I just ask a clarification question there around? Uh, so when you're talking about your competency levels, one, two, up to five, are you combining both the technical and the behavioural skills? No, in no. Those? They're, they're all separate. They are individual competency sets. So an individual will go through, do a number of behavioural number of uh, management or leadership depending on what the expectation of their job role is if they're not in a management or a leadership role they wouldn't necessarily get the that competency set presented to them then they get the technical competencies right so they are sort of three when, when you see the competency assessment you get it as one full list yeah but they are actually subdivided and owned by different people in the business as to what the um, requirements are Right. Okay, great. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, Carol. Thanks, Alistair. Um, Sashin, have your hand up. 
Uh, yes, I just wanted to ask about um, the role of the sponsors and the maintainer in terms of your presentation. Um, whether, for example, you would be requiring sponsors to do this project controls training, and how do you create like an integrated project team so that you don't like have a handover situation with the maintainer uh, in terms of benefits management? And 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 if I can be cheeky to ask a a, a second question, which is that. Um, Separate to machine learning, CP6 is quite interesting because you have a lot of separate initiatives to digitize practices in the railway, whether that be um, railway site diaries or creating uh, workflow automation for NEC for contract administration. So it, it, it is, is that happening and how, how, how is that being, being spearheaded? Yeah. Right. Um, I'll answer uh, yeah, again. I'll answer the second one first, actually, because that's probably a slightly easier one to answer. Because um, the each of the functional areas will be driving their own arena. So I can only really speak from a controls perspective as to what we're doing. I'm aware of some of the other digitization initiatives and um, so in the commercial arena and and other arenas. Um, the focal point of that is always it ends up in the region and that's the challenge so it, it's back into the capital delivery organization the commercial organizations etc within the region and what they do is they look at all these change initiatives so they ball up with a change initiative saying i want to do this they may put a block up to say alistair we've got too much on we cannot cope with that additional initiative on top of that or it's a case of we can't cope with it, but actually we can see it's a higher priority, so we need to go back around the loop. So what you find is in each of our um, business regions, there is a whole change, it's a business change, a regional change initiative, which is trying to manage how we implement from a sort of functional perspective in reality onto that or that part of the organization and make sure that they have the capacity to take that on board and what the timing is so what you may find is as a as an initiative owner i may have five key dates of when these things will be delivered and implemented within the business over um, a protracted number of years and that's just purely down to the capacity and the requirement and the urgency within that region for them to receive that so it, it's it's a hard dynamic, but it's, it's really around the conversations of um, understanding what what is possible and the art of the possible. Um, do you want to just repeat that first question, Miss Tashi? Apologies. So uh, it's just it's just um, within network rail, you know, you have separate functions. For example, for sponsors, the maintainer, yeah. and right. uh, and you know, in many cases, for example, the risk person is min there's a trade off between themselves and the project controls function. And how does do you go about to create like an integrated project team in that environment? So, for example, does, does the sponsor have to do your, your project controls training, you know, or those type of things? No, the so the Again, that, that trade-off is all done at a regional level, so it's not done by me centrally as a um, sort of HQ function. Um, I'd, I wouldn't have a clue, um, and it would be completely inappropriate. So each of the delivery organisations um, has their own subset of controls. So we talked about, I briefly talked about the centralisation, decentralisation. So they all have their own equivalent of a sort of mini HQ team for the region. And within that, they, they then allocate their resources. Um, so they look at their sort of custodians of all the, all the so shall we say, the planners or the controls people, reporting specialists, or whoever it is within their regional domain. And they make sure that they're assigned to the right projects. And that's what I was talking about earlier with Carol about moving people around, generally is within a regional, a regional group rather than at a national level. Um, in terms of sponsors, um, what we've been doing with the sponsors is actually, because most of the sponsorship is more akin to uh, project and program management rather than the specialism and controls, 
they're all going through and they've all voted um, to essentially undertake the APM. And they're actually, look, some of them are now becoming chartered project managers um, through the APM because that's what they want to do and, and where they thought the best aspiration. There is absolutely nothing to stop them going and doing any of the controls uh, courses or the planning courses. It's just, um, it wouldn't, I wouldn't be so looking for the sponsor to do that other than they want to do it because um, it's the right thing for them to do or it's, it's in a career development or it's an area of interest. So right. hopefully that answers your question, Chelsea. Yeah, sure. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you both. Um, Martin Paver, is that your hand up still? Not anymore, Steve. Not anymore. <laughs> right. Less is more. Yeah. Thank you, Shree. Um, Right, well, Alistair, I think we'll we'll draw the Q and A to 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 a, 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 conclu a conclusion or a pause, maybe for follow up uh, in the years to come, um, and reward you. Well, thank you above all for that. It was really good stuff, and I would um, be very interested to follow the competence and the the analytical journey, and uh, we'll reward you with a poem. <laughs> Yeah, you uh, so Paul, are you ready? <laughs> always ready. I'm always ready. I'm, oh, I, yeah, you were you know, ready. I'm, I'm like Alistair and his team. I'm always ready. <laughs> so here we go. I need a title, Alistair, but I'm, I'll, I'll have to come to you on that. <clears throat> here we go. Needed a planner with a metaphorical spanner who can take one out of the works, ensure that the network is a net that works, able to wear a variety of hats and shirts because a thousand miles of track, sorry, 30,000 miles of track is a lot of clickety clack. There's also a lot of output and outcomes to go under 20,000 bridges. We're not talking Jeff, we're talking process. Where the team all are all aboard on an evolutionary path, into machine learning that's going to keep the world wheels future turning past knowledge driving and prediction what could happen what does it mean in simple terms you'll get from waterloo to wigan as the world heads deeper into an unknown dark night and everybody is looking for the proverbial at the end of light it's a good time to mention We've got untold tunnels, and every one of them, as Michael Portillo will attend, says has the unique dividends of opening at both ends. Thank you. Right. Well, that will be well, enshrined. That will be enshrined in prose, Paul, and, and we'll hopefully film it and get that out to the it, thousands it, of avid listeners next week. It, <laughs> it, it's coming. It's coming to a platform near you soon. Yeah. Good. Uh, nine and three quarters, probably. Yep. <laughs> Ten and three quarters. Can't remember. Anyway, well, thanks again, Alistair. Um, now, just pause for a few uh, brief messages. Um, again, calling Carol, uh, you were in asking for people to take part in focus groups on employability skills last week. Do you want to give us an update on where you are and what you might need still? Yes, thank you. Yeah, so um, I'm doing a, a PhD looking at the skills employers are saying they want. Um, and uh, are they interpreted in the same way that academics interpret them? Because um, with all of the uh, academic regulation there is today, um, if universities don't produce employable graduates, they can be fined, they can be closed down. Um, the stakes are really, really high for universities. And yet we still don't have a national standard in being able to um, define and measure the skills in a way that we can teach, practice and assess them in our schools and colleges and universities. So that's why I'm focused on looking at this degree. And last week um, I ran my first um, focus group test and that was to test the, um, the, the questions I'm asking in the focus groups that will be rolled out um, sometime from mid-November. Um, I'm looking for, for focus group test volunteers. Those volunteers can also join the live focus groups. Um, so one doesn't preclude the other. 
Um, and particularly, Alistair, I was really interested in the, the way you were describing the competencies and the split between technical and, um, uh, and more people-based uh, and wondered if, uh, if you might be interested in coming on board and having a conversation about skills and anyone else. Yeah, yeah. Most There's welcome. a big please at the back of that. <laughs> no, no, Carothy, drop me a note uh, either through Steve or directly. Um, more than happy to. And there are far more people in my organisation who have far more skill in that than I do. So uh, I can make sure that you at least get connected to those, if nothing else. That's wonderful. Thank you. Um, you, you might all like to know that um, uh, there's a new commission being set up alongside the Skills Commission. There's now a Financial Services Skills Commission. And uh, at, a little as you're doing in your um, subject field, they are looking specifically at the skills and uh, competencies that the finance professions are going to need now and into the future. Uh, so I'm having a conversation with them around how they do their, uh, their methodology and sharing what I've been going through. Um, so, the, Steve, I hope you'll be pleased to hear that, you know, the, the, the word is getting out there on the need to have these really valid measures um, that are tangible. Yeah, good news. Paul, are you asking, is that your hand or are you just, are you just messing with Carol? Then? It's, my, it's, my, it's my hand. I just want to say, Carol, I'm really hurt. You asked uh, Alistair, but you didn't ask me to join. <laughs> Everybody is welcome to join, <laughs> and particularly I'm, with your I'm oratorical still, I'm skills. Still here, <laughs> okay, right. So, um, uh, any anything else, Carol? Um, and no. Uh, just if if you're interested, um, could you let either um, Steve know directly or or direct to me, um, and I can share more information, including Paul, please. Um, yes. And I'll share more information and um, uh, and get you involved in the process. OK, right. Thanks, fabulous. Carol. Right. We'll keep uh, well, we'll certainly keep the story going, certainly with the skills uh, aspects. As I said, it's one that's going to run and run and grow and grow. Um, uh, a couple of messages then from me. Um, a newsflash, the uh, ISO EVM implementation guide, the Value Management Guide. We had a meeting this week and we all agreed, just so that you're ready, uh, that it will be published in September 2022. So I hope that's enough notice for you to, to, uh, to, to, to get ready for its arrival. Uh, but work is proceeding quite well, um, joking aside, and the working draft is, is scheduled to be completed towards the, the end of this year. And then it goes through long, tortuous uh, consultative periods uh, thereafter, much, much longer than BSI. Um, I flagged up that uh, within the control standard that we're developing for BSI, there will be a request for assistance and help on a specific work, which is um, purposing the diagram to the structure of the document um, that's coming out. So trying to marry uh, an, a, a, a diagram that looks at the overarching landscape of controls, hopefully including the brave new world of, 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 of things like analytics, as well as uh, benefits management and, and, and use beyond the normal life cycle of, of project controls is coming and there will be a request to see uh, for help uh, and for people to, to get around a table and work that diagram through. Um, I think apart from that uh, it probably remains for oh just to tell you about next week's uh, meeting um, same time same place uh, next week we have a pair uh, coming to talk to us Roger Joby um, from the with a uh, pharmaceutical uh, background, and Dr. Christine Unter Hinzenberger, who I've known for a few years now, is a doctor researching project management at Leeds University, and they will be discussing that rather thorny issue of relationships and the relationships between clients and contractors in projects. And they've been conducting research um, to, to to back up some of the advice and guidance they'll be going. So we'll be looking forward to probably a more conversational approach next week than, than, than we've had uh, to date. But uh, again, that's part of the programme. So uh, without further ado, um, we will be updating you with outputs in the nearest future. Um, thanks again to Sashin uh, from Dada Enterprises for sponsoring this programme. And if you know anybody else who wants to, to come forward and, 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 uh, and help support this, this activity, uh, most welcome, point, point them at me. Um, I will wish you 
therefore, a very good week ahead. Um, I personally am looking forward, as many of us are, to uh, further lockdown constraints coming into play in London on Friday, but I'm sure that that means that we'll be joining. We're already there. Uh, but apart from that, have a good weekend, uh, have a good week, and uh, look forward to seeing you again next week. So, goodbye. Thank you. Yeah, Thank wave. you. A rolling wave. Oh, I'm going to put... Uh,